Right, so we're on lecture four, spirituality beyond gender. And you should have your hand out there. So it says it's beginning with uh, post-gender priesthood. But as I was thinking, actually, late last night, I decided I needed to put an introductory piece into it, so which is not on your handouts. And so what I was thinking last night is, today's two lectures, I had three objectives in a chronological order. The first objective was to try to stop gender war kind of thinking. The second objective was to create a gender dance, such as you find in Celtic wisdom that we spoke of in the, on the first day. And then thirdly, to transcend gender completely in our understanding of a spirituality. So as to kind of uh, end gender war thinking, create gender dance, and then finally to transcend gender completely in a different kind of spirituality. So to do that, um, I want to bring your attention to the fact that there are basically two kinds of spirituality that we find, are two kinds of religions. And they're sometimes called the ascending religions with an upward facing triangle and descending uh, religions with a downward facing triangle. And I'm going to give you kind of attributes of both of them, backwards and forwards. So ascending religions tend to be monotheistic. So the three great monotheistic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are very definitely ascending and they're monotheistic religions. Descending religions tend to be more polytheistic. The ascending religions are much more recent. The descending religions are much more ancient. Ascending religions tend to be more kind of masculine in their theologies. Descending religions tend to be more feminine in their theologies. Ascending religions tend to be more focused on the transcendence of God. And descending religions tend to be much more focused on the immanence of God. Ascending religions tend to focus on the evolution, the return to source. And descending uh, uh, religions tend to focus on devolution, on our journey from God, from God to soul, to causal body, to mental body, to astral body, to etheric body, to physical body. Um, ascending religions tend to focus on the hereafter, and descending religions tend to focus on the here and the now. So ascending religions are concerned with heaven, and descending religions are concerned with earth and with nature. Ascending religions are concerned with the spirit in the spacesuit, and descending religions are concerned with the spacesuit that is housing the spirit. So if you actually put the two of them together, an upward uh, pointing triangle and a downward pointing triangle, and you superimpose them, you get the start of David. And in some senses, that's, that's the kind of the penultimate stage of uh, final spirituality, in my opinion, where there's a, a dance between the ascending and the descending with all of the attributes that I've just mentioned here now. So in Buddhist thinking, for instance, that could be represented by two of the late stages of mysticism. One is called Turiya, and the other is called Turiyatita. So Turiya in Buddhism is the notion that you step into witnessing consciousness, that you realize that everything your sensorium is delivering to you, and everything your intellect is giving you, and everything every faculty of you is giving to you are just clouds in the sky. And so Turiya is the idea that you can step back from identification with um, your, your ego or your incarnation and just witness the events of incarnation. Turiyatita says it's that and. So Turiyatita is the ability to, uh, to have the Turiya perspective where you're in a witnessing consciousness and at the same time to participate in your incarnational experiences. So it's a both and rather than a neither or. And you find the same notion in cultural anthropology the notion of the participant observer, that the cultural anthropologist is not just sneaking into a village in the Amazon jungle and watching what the natives are doing. For one thing, the natives knew the guy was coming before he knew he was even going to go. Uh, so the idea that you can kind of sneak in and just see what folks are doing without actually uh, influencing what they're doing is meaningless. And so cultural anthropology finally realized that every anthropologist is both a participant you know, and an observer that she's having an influence on what she's actually observing. And so that's where, that's an introductory piece I want to append to what I wanted to say today. 
And so that's my, my objective in the, uh, in the two lectures today on spirituality beyond gender. So that's the introduction to it. So with that in mind then, what do I mean by a post-gender priesthood? And what I want to say is that I was very careful this morning to show why women are as entitled or even more entitled to be priests you know, than men are. And so I'm trying to equalize the field where they've been discriminated against by the churches. But the debate on men versus women priests is only a stage on the road. And I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to get stuck at the stage. So it's not about being either a man or a woman, but about embodying the qualities that show our God nature during the priesthood of our incarnation. That's really where I'm headed today. So it's looking at what is it about, uh, about us that can allow us to embody the qualities that show our God nature, our divinity, even while we're in incarnation. So just a few random thoughts about that. I believe that the function of any priest is to be, I'm going to make up a term, a veil piercer. To be able to kind of uh, go through the thin places, that's the function of any, any priest. It's uh, to be able to help a community glimpse the mystical reality behind the illusion of mere physicality. That's the function of the priest. And anybody who is willing and able to do that, in my opinion, is a priest. So it's not about you know, a hierarchy commissioning you or ordaining you for a particular mission. That's the IC on the cake where for some communities. But it's basically about, are you willing and you have the qualities to embody the mystical reality and to kind of show forth the mystical reality, to pierce the veil that separates the mystical from the mundane or the sacred from the secular? If you have the ability to do that and the willingness to do that, then you don't need any hierarchy to appoint you to the task or to ordain you for it. You need maybe just a community uh, to ask you to perform in that kind of uh, uh, regard on their behalf. And so I said to you before that I believe that there are, actually there are four qualities to, um, uh, to uh, being, being a priest. The first one is that there, there's a need in the community. The second one is that you volu somebody volunteers to address that need. The third thing is that they have the qualities and are given the training to do that. And fourthly, that the, com the community says to them, we want you to be our priest or to act as a priest on our behalf. And that's for me, that's what a, a priest then is. So it's beyond mere male or female thinking. There are only stages on the roads to understanding priesthood. So that's section, section A. So the next section I call Taoist virtues transcending uh, gender. And I have uh, four or five, five, five aspects to that, five sub subparts. So the first thing, it becomes important for us to start cleaning up our language. So there's a place beyond matriarchy and patriarchy. There's a place beyond the male and the female. And in order to be truly spiritual people, we have to transcend that kind of thinking and that kind of language. Uh, this has kind of sexually stereotyped how we think about spiritual qualities. To try to divide up, you know, virtues or tasks or missions to male and female you know, aspects is to stereotype uh, spiritual qualities. We have to leave that behind us. We have to go way beyond that. Uh, we have to be able to differentiate between the God who is and God as we experience her. Between the ineffable experience, the ineffable essence, which the ascending religions you know, are focused on, you know, and the uh, immanence where the descending religions are focused on, we have to transcend that artificial divide. Uh, and we have to realize that there is a place where the immanence and the transcendence dance together. And our spirituality needs to come from that, from that dance. So uh, God does not have gender and the soul does not have gender. But as human beings, we find ourselves in either female or male spacesuits. And therefore, we have to try to experience the transcendence of God in the imminence and through the prism of our own gender. So that's the, that's the Buddhist turiyati, turiya, turiyatita. It's the participant observer. But we have to transcend the language and transcend the thinking. Even as we find ourselves in spacesuits that have a gender, 
We cannot identify with that or make that uh, our primal identity. We have to be able to transcend that in our languaging and an understanding of the qualities that go into becoming a priest. And for that reason, uh, I've chosen in this lecture to focus on uh, yin-yang language or yin-yang virtues or yin-yang qualities rather than stereotypical ascending qualities or descending qualities or male qualities or female qualities. And I'm going to give, just give a few examples where we see these kinds of, uh, we see this yin-yang Taoist kind of thinking all around us. So if you live, you know, where I live or where you live maybe, um, I look around me here and I see yang attributes. I see mountains, I see rocks, I see stability, I see the sun, I see the day, I see light. These are very yang qualities of life. I also see the stream that runs through where I live. I feel the air that flows. I see the moon at night. I see nighttime. I see darkness. And these are all yin qualities. And in the course of uh, uh, perambulation, I'm experiencing all those qualities. And rather than say some are female qualities and some are male qualities because they're not one or the other, I would say rather they're yin and yang qualities. And yin and yang for me is the penultimate stage before absolute uh, uh, final kinds of spirituality. And in uh, Celtic mythology, as I tried to explain, you know, in the, yesterday, this is a complete dance. You know, there is no discrepancy whatsoever between a culture and nature for the Celts, between the male and the female. They dance together. They don't war with each other. So they'd already left this language of uh, separation, you know, 2,000 years back. So that's a kind of a, a, a metaphor. That's kind of a um, looking at nature as we experience nature with its yin qualities and its yang qualities. I'll take another kind of simple example. You know, Michael Choi is a great kayaker. I don't know if any of you others, if you guys uh, do any kayaking. But in kayaking, you've got a single paddle. You have a single piece in your hands, but there's two blades on it that you're moving from side to side. Now, if all you paddle with is the left hand and you keep paddling with the left hand, you're going to find yourself going around in a clockwise circle, round and round and round and getting nowhere. If you do all your paddling with the right hand, you're going to find yourself going around in a counterclockwise circle and you're getting nowhere. If you want to go on a straight line and make progress, you have to alternate between the two. You go with the right hand and the left hand. And the same thing is true, I believe, in uh, yin and yang qualities. The line that takes you, you know, into deep spirituality is both yin qualities and yang qualities. And so it brings me to the, the, the second, uh, the third, recognizing the Tao. So for me then, Taoism or the yin yang symbol, you know, is the, I would say, the penultimate stage of spirituality. It's the second to last stage of spirituality. And it becomes very important that we not, you know, misuse yin-yang language. Uh, yin and yang is not a division that runs between males and females. That males are on the yang side and females are on the, the yin side. And it is not a line that runs between the good guys and the bad guys. You know, that the good guys are on the yin side, yin side and the bad guys are on the yang side. That is not a proper use of yin and yang qualities. Yin and yang run down through the middle of every single one of us. Every one of us has light and darkness. Everyone has sun and moon qualities. Everyone has strength and compassion qualities. And so every single one of us then, when we understand who we really are, we operate on a spectrum as far as yin yang qualities are concerned. Whether that person, whether you're a male or a female, you, can, you, you lie on this spectrum and you can uh, lie in a very important place or you can err either by being too yin or too yang. Whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. You can be a woman and too yang, or a woman and too yin. You can be a man and too yin, or a man and too yang. So you can err no matter what gender you uh, associate with. So you have to really look at these qualities for what they are in themselves. So the ideal is that you have to find the correct balance within yourself of the yin and the yang qualities. So firstly, there's an internal individual balance between these kinds of virtues. The second one is that there are occasions in your life when you have to favor uh, yin over yang, 
or or yang over yin, depending on on the occasion. And this morning I mentioned such a one. If you come across, you know, an overturned truck in which a little baby is trapped, and you lift the truck, you know, upward, right? It is appropriate for you to be in a yang modality. You're not going to do it out of yin uh, ability. But when you rescue the baby and you hold the baby to your to your chest, you need to move immediately into yin qualities. And it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, when you lift that truck and when you hold that baby, you have to access both kinds of qualities in order to be to make a real intervention here. And the third thing I want to say about the ideal is that if you're part of a team on any kind of a project, then it is appropriate that some members of the team, whether they're male or female, it doesn't matter. If you're a member of a team, that is appropriate. It is appropriate for some members of the team to use more yang energy and for other members of the team to use more yin energy. And it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It just depends on the place you're, you have in the team for a particular kind of uh, 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 event. It's appropriate then that, that there be uh, some people who use more yin energy for the situation and some people on the same team who use more yang energy. So I would say then that gender is a little bit like time. Gender is an artifact of incarnation. So uh, with time, even though it's an artifact of incarnation, we have to accept it and we have to work with it, but not identify with it, not be identified by time. And the same thing is true of gender. We have to work with the gender in which we find ourselves in a particular incarnation, but we cannot identify with it. It is not who we are, basically. It's simply the spacesuit we've chosen for this incarnation. So real spirituality, then, is not about the suppression of gender or an attempt to turn human beings into some kind of anemic hermaphrodites, but it is about the acceptance of the, of the dance between God's transcendence and God's imminence during the mystery of incarnation. That's what spirituality looks like, you know, as it moves into this penultimate stage. So to make a few kinds of comparisons, it's like, it's like uh, personality. You can't form meaningful relationships by attempting to suppress the personality of one of the partners. You form meaningful relationships by respecting and dancing with the differences between the two personalities. That's how you form relationships not by the suppression of the personality of one person, but by dancing with the two personalities, respecting and honoring both of them. That's how great relationships develop, or like languages and cultures. You don't form a peaceful world by suppressing individual languages and individual cultures. You do it by respecting and by dancing with the languages and the cultures of other peoples. So right now we got 5,000 languages and cultures on the planet. And Nancy Hannibal made a great intervention yesterday when she talked about her time in the Peace Corps in Kazakhstan and uh, the realization that, you know, you can't suppress the language and the culture in order to bring a primitive people into the 21st century so they can sit at the table of the goodies of the economic, you know, revolution. The realization that only by respecting the culture and dancing with their gifts, you know, uh, can you meaningfully uh, cross-fertilize and learn from them and teach. So that's a little bit like what the yin yang dance as far as I'm concerned. I want then to mention again, biblical characters that I've gone back to again and again and again. So when I look at, for instance, Magdalene and Jesus, you know, Mother Mary, and I, I say to you again and again that these two women were not grays because they were all yin. They were great because they had an extraordinary balance between yin energy and yang energy. That was their greatness. Not because they were wilting females who were all yin, but because they were extraordinarily balanced human beings who had both yin and yang qualities. The greatness of Jesus was not because he was all yang. It was because he had this extraordinary balance of yin and yang in his own personality. So... Again, I say that God does not have gender, but we can experience God in both yin and yang aspects. And so even some of the languaging that we use when we talk about God or about great avatars, 
you know, if we talk, we can talk about God as a savior, and that's a kind of a yang attribute. But we can talk also about um, uh, God as mother, and that's a yin attribute. We can talk about, you know, healing, and that's very yin. We can talk about God as father, and that's very yang. We can call about, talk about God being merciful, and that's very yin. We can talk about God being very just, and that's very yang. And so again, in our languaging, we have to continue this, this bipedality of dancing from uh, one foot to the other, of kayaking with both hands, of utilizing both kinds of virtues in the pursuit of spirituality. And so there's, one, there's a place where we got this language really, really uh, very, very well. It's the great serenity prayer. You know the prayer that says, God grant me the courage to change the things I can, the humility to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. There's a prayer that dances between these two yin and yang qualities. So grant me the courage, which is very yang, to change the things I can, the humility, which is very yin, to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom, which is the balance, to know the difference between the two. And so uh, this prayer got it, got it right on the balance between the two. And so uh, basically, a spirituality beyond gender is going to be a spirituality in which we've transcended you know, male-female thinking or male-female qualities and use yin and yang attributes and virtues as the final stepping stone into ultimate spirituality in which there, uh, even then there isn't even yin or yang left. There is only the imminence of God dancing with the transcendence of God. And so for the rest of the, kind of lecture part, if you have your papers in front of you, I invite you now to just pick up the, those three pages having to do with uh, uh, this fourth lecture. About oh, maybe 15 years ago, uh, I one time I just sat down and I began to think of all the kind of the virtues I could think of, you know, and the attributes I could think of, or the qualities I could think of, and I just wrote them all down as I could think of them in a long, 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 long list. And then I decided to see if I could break them up into two columns, one column representing yin virtues or yin attributes, and the other representing the, coral, coral, the correlation uh, between that virtue in its yin aspect and in its yang aspect. And so the first page you see before you, if you have it, page one of that three-page handout, is those the two the columns that I created. And I'm trying to show that between the yin attributes and the yang attributes, as I put them down, there's a dance going on. They're correlated with each other. So I can just walk very slowly through them uh, to say what I mean. So if I take the notion of artistic ability, I would classify that as a yin quality. What would the yang attribute of artistic ability look like? It would like, look like a technical ability. You know, the ability you know, to be an IT specialist, a software engineer or whatever. And so the creativity of the, of the artist in its yin capacity is you know, correlated to the technical abilities on the yang side of the equation. If you take uh, receptivity, being receptive and being open in some senses, you know, the corollary a yang virtue would be being active, where a yin attribute would be mercy focused. The corresponding yang attribute would be justice focused, where yin would be, where yin would be um, soft, a yin attribute would be softness. The yang attribute corresponding to it would be hardness. And one is appropriate in some circumstances and the other in a different circumstance. Yin attributes would be kind of a right brain activity and the corresponding uh, yang would be left brain activity. Diffuseness and the ability to disperse energy would, would be corresponding to the ability to be uh, narrowly focused or directed in your attention. A wide angle perspective, you know, in yin, corresponds with a narrow focus in yang, where you're borrowing in on a topic. And obviously you will use both even in, in the solving of a problem. Um, a wide angle perspective on life or on a vista, as I look out at the, here at the mountains and the trees around, I'm giving it a wide you know, vista. 
I can now narrow in to the nearest redwood, which is literally just 10 meters from where I'm sitting. So I could focus narrowly on that one, the, the nearest redwood to me. Intuitive ability would be a, a yin quality, and rational thinking would be the corresponding yang quality, yang quality. Emotional, and there's an importance to emotion, would be a yin attribute, and the corresponding one would be, and the yang column would be logical. On the yin side of the equation, humility would be a yin quality, and confidence would be the corresponding yang quality. On the yin side of the equation, relatedness would be a yin quality, and on the other side, independence would be the corresponding yang quality. On the yin side, loving would be a yin quality, and on the yang side, powerful would be the yang attribute. On the yin side, you would have uh, compassionate, and on the yang side of that, you would have courageous. On the yin side, you would have dark, and on the um, yang side, you would have light. On the yin side, you, on the yin side, you would have nurturing, and on the yang side, you would have pro protective. On the yin side, you have tender love, and on the yang side, you would have tough love. On the inside, you would have patience, and on the yang side of that, you would have uh, task-oriented. On the inside, you have con considerate, and on the opposite, you would have assertive. On the inside, you would have cooperative, and on the other side, you would have competitive. And finally, on the inside, you would have community-oriented, and on the yang side, individuated. And I want to keep emphasizing, that these are not male and female attributes. We've transcended gender at this stage. And, not, and it's not that one side is good and the other side is bad. It is that each of these have appropriate you know, occasions in which a particular side of the equation is being called into operation. And whether you find yourself in a male body or a female body, if you're interested in becoming an evolved, you know, enlightened being, you must have the ability to call upon both sides you know, of this equation on, in the particular situation. So that's just a list of attributes that give you some sense of you know, the difference between yin and yang to not be confused with uh, male or female thinking. So on the basis of that, then I created a few exercises and I'm gonna just step us through those uh, very briefly for a little bit of time. And uh, they're yours to do with what you will, you know, tonight or whenever you get the opportunity of going to these exercises in more detail on your own or with a partner or even in a community, small group if you, if you wish. So on page two of that handout, I, I call it a self-assessment. So for, for each yin attribute on that list, I, get, I have 20 on each. There's 20 qualities on each side uh, of that table. So look at the yin side first. And for each of the 20 qualities on the yin side of the equation, give yourself a score between zero and five, and then total up your yin energy. Then go over to the other side of the table. And for each of the yang, yang attributes, of which there are 20 as well, give yourself a score, again, between zero and five, and then total up all of the yang energy in you and then compare the two. And there's a second table here on page two. Very, very simply, I've just divided into five you know, pieces. Obviously, this is a spectrum. It's, they're not discrete pieces. It's a spectrum, but this is just to make it easier to do the following exercises. So I've suggested here that, you know, I'm gonna break up the possible results you got into five categories. So as you've scored yourself on the yin qualities and reached a total, and as you scored yourself on the yang qualities and reached a total, you know, you have a figure in front of you at the end of that exercise, a figure for yin and a figure for yang. And each of them is going to be between, will be between zero, you know, and, um, and 50. 50 no, between zero and 100 on each, on each side of the equation. Now, I'm just going to divide that up very, very roughly into five categories, although they lie actually on a spectrum. If you're in section A and you find that you're 100% yin 
then the comment is obviously you are far too much, there's far too much yin energy in your life. If you fall into row two here, into B, where you're 75% yin and only 25% yang, you're too much yin, even then. If you fall into row number three, number C here, and you find that you're 50% yin and 50% yang, then you, there's a good balance in your life. This is obviously on average, different situations will call for different distributions, but on average, if there's 50-50 balance in your life, then you're in a really, really good, good shape. If you take your scores and you fall into row number D, so you're 25% yin and you're 75% yang, then you're too much yang. And if you find yourself in row number E there, where you're 0% yin and you're 100% yang, then you're far too much yang. So it's a very it's a down and dirty way of just figuring out in your own life. Yeah, among the distribution of qualities, you know, uh, where do you lie on average? Because in individual situations, you're going to have, have to move to one side of the spectrum or the other. Or if you're a member of a team, you'll be called upon to move through the spectrum to a different place in the spectrum for the purposes of being a team member for a particular kind of uh, project and then move back, you know, in a different kind of project. So that's the, uh, the, the first exercise there. And obviously you can't do that right now, but you can do it maybe later on tonight or uh, some other time. So that's the first exercise. So I want to move on to page number three in that handout. For this exercise, I suggest that choose a letter, you know, on, from the previous page, from page two, in the A row, B row, C, D or E row. Uh, choose a letter from that. So choose a row from that sample table. And in your opinion, uh, choose the one that best describes the energy of each of the following systems. So now you're going to choose a letter that best represents how you view U.S. politics. Do you think it falls into table A, where it's 100% yen, or B, 75% yen, C, 50-50, D, 25% yen, or E, 0% yen? So... In your understanding of U.S. politics, you know, assign uh, a, a letter or a row and says, you know, B best represents my understanding of American politics or E represents my understanding of American politics. Do the same exercise. Um, if you were brought up in the Roman Catholic Church, do it for the Roman Catholic Church. If you were brought up a Lutheran or whatever, you know, uh, organized religious system you come from, do the same exercise with that. Look at, for instance, for a lot of us will be Roman Catholic. Look at the Roman Catholic Church in your experience of it. Currently, or when you were growing up as a child, or throughout its history, and figure out which letter best represents your understanding of how this organization has operated throughout time, or during your childhood, or right now, as you understand it. And I've just picked these kinds of questions kind of randomly. The third exercise would be to look at your understanding of corporate capitalism. And again, assign a letter to that. In your understanding of corporate capitalism, which of these rows best encapsulates it? Is it D, 25% yen, or is it A, 100% yen? Or what's your opinion? Where would you put it? Your understanding of corporate capitalism. For those of you who are members of COJ, I invite you to do the same exercise. Whether or not you're a recent member or you've been there since the very beginning, uh, as you interface and you understand and, uh, COJ and as you experience it, what letter best describes it of these five letters? What's been your experience with COJ? The next exercise is to do that for your family of origin. You grew up in a family. When you look back at your family of origin, either when you were a child growing up through the system or when you left and either got married yourself or left home, you know, or as you interface with your siblings right now, which letter best describes the energy of, of the family system? 
And then the next exercise for yourself. If you were to average out your kind of um, where you tend to land in life, um, on average, obviously there'll be different situations in which you'll be at a different place. But on average, if you were to pick a letter from those five letters that best represents how you operate in the world, which letter would you choose? So this can be, I think, a really powerful way of um, reassessing what you mean by virtue and how you, you know, take, um, take charge of your own spiritual evolution. You can make the kinds of changes you think are necessary on the basis of the feedback that you've given yourself, or you can contribute to society, or you can try to will the human safari forward, whether it's U.S. politics or the Roman Catholic Church or corporate capitalism or COJ or your family of origin. How would you now try to, what kind of energy would you want to put out there subsequently after you've figured out, you know, where you lie yourself, you know, on these qualities and where these other systems lie? How can you be then most effective, you know, in adding, you know, um, evolution to that, uh, to that process? Here's the next exercise. And I know it's a lot of exercises. It may take you, if you choose, you know, the rest of May to really dig into this exercise if you think it's worthwhile. So the next exercise is to take a significant event from your past. Go back sometime. A significant event from your past and then choose one of these letters, A, B, C, D, or E from the table on page two which best describes how you handle the situation. And then ask yourself the question, if I had been in greater balance, would I have handled it differently? Or was I really balanced in my handling of that significant event in my life? The next part would be to take a recent significant event in your life maybe in the last in 2020 the last uh, five months take a recent event and then pick out the category the table on the table a b c d or e that best represents how you handled that situation that recent situation and then ask yourself the question uh, was i in a balanced place you know in my handling of that situation, or could I have done it differently? If so, where would I have moved along that spectrum from yin to yang? The next exercise is to pick a situation in which you think it would be appropriate to be more yin than yang. Think of any situation in your life coming up, you know, or which you're currently facing, and ask yourself the the question, uh, is this a situation in which it is more appropriate to be yin than yang? And then finally, think about a situation in which it would be more appropriate to be yang than yin. And I think what you'll find is that it will help you move beyond the stereotypes of um, spiritual thinking beyond gender, a spirituality beyond gender, a spirituality beyond just identifying as a male or a female, a spirituality beyond, you know, associating just with ascending religions which are heaven-focused or, you know, earth-focused uh, descending religions into a true spirituality which is the start of David, which is the dance, you know, the Celtic dance between the goddesses and the gods, or between nature and nurture, or between God's transcendence and, and her immanence. It allows you to kind of take your spirituality, you know, much more into your own hands and possibly, you know, operate or orient or use as a kind of a GPS for your future development, a spirituality which is going to serve you better and serve our world better than the stereotypical ones that we've inherited and are currently employed. Namaste, guys.
And so obviously a lot of these in this list, there's a lot of kind of entanglement in it. Many of these qualities, you know, uh, interact very strongly with other qualities on the same column, in the yin mm -hmm. column or in the yang column. And so loving and powerful for me, loving is where you're in a much more kind of accepting uh, of the situation modality, where you don't mm -hmm. feel the need to make a significant intervention in a situation and that you're more in a passive, not in the sense of doing nothing, but in the mm -hmm. sense of receptivity, you yes. know, of, of listening, you know, to the situation. And there are other situations in where it is more appropriate to be powerful, you know, and to intervene in a situation. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, um, you, for instance, when I was living in Kenya, um, the houses in Kenya were around huts, and the fire was always in the center of the, the room. And there was, um, there was a hole in the center of the room, and the fire was in the hole. And then the family would sit around it, and the food often was cooked. You know, the pot, the fire probably over that. And so I'm thinking of a situation where, you know, a little baby at the crawling stage is on the floor and mother is, you know, trying to attend to other chores in the house. And the mm -hmm. baby is fascinated by this sparkling fire. And he begins crawling towards the fire. He thinks it's fascinating. And he's going to put his hand into it, you know, in 10 seconds time. So the, lo the, the, the appropriate thing in that situation is not to be loving, say, look at my baby. He's learning how to crawl. That would be a really dumb way to re relate to that situation. You have to be powerful. You've got to jump up and grab the baby. Mm -hmm. But if the same little baby, you know, is now learning to stand upright and to walk, and after two or three steps, he falls on his butt. and say, oh, my God, he's going to hurt himself. So the next time he gets up to try to walk, you won't let him walk. You're going to intervene and hold him because you're afraid he's going to fall and hurt his little tuchus. Right. So, uh, you won't allow to attempt to walk. And what happens is the child will never learn to walk. Right. So in the situation, it becomes then a, uh, the loving thing may be just to witness and just be there. Mm -hmm. But the loving thing may be to intervene and take control of it. So that's what I mean by loving and powerful there. Um, maybe I didn't explain it clearly <laughs> enough. You're not adding both to each other. You have one list of yin, all between zero and five, and a total on yin. And then another list on yang and a total on yang. So you're not adding artistic to technical. You are, you're not acting you know, receptive to active. You're, uh, you're uh, scoring receptive in one, cat, in one uh, channel and you're scoring yourself on active in a totally different column. The second table is percentages. So maybe I should have put 200. I should have actually, I, I said it when I was talking about the table, but from the table itself, it looks inaccurate. So I'm, I'm saying that when you add up all your yin scores, did you get 100% yin, you know, or 70% yin, whatever. So that table on, on, the, on page two is about percentages, total percentages. So I'm glad you asked that question because it may be confusing to other people as well. Too. Uh, you're going to look then at, the, at your yang qualities have only 40%. Uh, so 40 is less than a medium. So you're a little bit less on the yang qualities than you perhaps would uh, wish for. As I'm saying here, these are just five discrete categories. Th this exists on a spectrum. You're going to get, you know, from zero to 100% in the table. And so I've just divided artificially into five groups to make it easier. But okay. when, you, when, you, when you give yourself a total for the yin qualities and a total for the uh, yang qualities, you'll then be able to estimate uh, overall, am I 100% yin or am I 20% yin or am I 35% yin? You can estimate that for yourself. But when you force it into this table, you're going to have to kind of, you know, identify it with a particular stream, an A stream, a B stream, whatever. That's brilliantly put, absolutely. And so very, very typically in kind of, um, in a lot of religions, Sophia tends to be identified with the feminine, like the Greek word Sophia, uh, it tends to be identified with the feminine. But uh, philosophia, 
philosophy is actually uh, philosophia, which means the love of wisdom. And that tends to be identified more with the, uh, with the male, has to do with kind of intellectualizing and philosophizing and thinking stuff through. And so uh, the word, the wisdom of Sophia will tend to be used in two different contexts. And so I agree with you that in some senses, uh, in, in the receptive modality, wisdom tends to be more a yin quality. And then the kind of the uh, expressive uh, element of it, it tends to be more yang quality. It's a very contentious topic because there's a very big difference between psychological androgyny and physiological androgyny. You know, people uh, tend to be born, the vast bulk of people tend to be born into either a male body or a female body. Now there are hermaph hermaphrodites who are born with both sets of genitalia. And there are certainly people who at some stage of their lives feel that they're, they would be much more comfortable in uh, a body of the other gender. But like a lot of situations, you can take this uh, to extreme. So the vast bulk of people, 99.999% of people, you know, are going to identify with the gender in which they were born. Now, some people are very uncomfortable in that situation, and it's appropriate. If somebody at age 22 determines that they need transgender surgery, you know, or to take hormones to shift their self-image, I personally have no problem with that. I have big problems when I find situations that have happened and they have happened where a five-year-old child who decides they want to be transgender and the parents won't agree to it because it's a five-year-old child. They don't want a five-year-old child going through surgery or hormonal treatment and they refuse it and a court intervenes and takes the child away from the parents and says that the parents are not allowing the child to choose his gender. I have a big problem with that, that a five-year-old child can decide to go transgender and make significant hormonal and surgical changes, which there, a lot of them will regret subsequently. And that's true in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the community of people who've changed renders. There's a significant number of people who after a few years are really upset with what they've done. And so to expect that a five-year-old child can make that choice and that parents who decide, no, we're not gonna allow you to do that, to mess your hormones around or to have surgery at age five and have a court come in and take the child away and accuse the, ch the parents of being, you know, uh, abusive parents. There's something really wrong with that situation. Really, really wrong. It's a question of, you know, the notion of the tail wagging the dog. This is a question of a single hair on the tail wagging the entire animal. So I think, you know, we, we've really uh, kind of, um, we've got ourselves in, into deep water really, really quickly with this issue. There are many aspects to it. If, for instance, in the morning that, Shaquille O'Neal decided he was a woman and he wanted to join the WNBA, the Women's National Basketball Association, and he insists on playing on a women's team, a guy who can practically dunk without ever even jumping off the floor. Is that, you know, is that really progress? Is that really assisting the kind of the evolution and the equality of, of females? There's a college in Connecticut right now in which the girls in the school have taken a legal action because there are two people in Connecticut on a, a girls athletics team who are transgender. They were born male. In their late teenage years, they decided to go transgender and they're literally wiping the floor with every, everything they entered they're winning, all of the competitions they're winning. And the girls are there who've been training, you know, whether it's you know, cross country or high jump or whatever, and they can't win anything because these two new girls are winning everything. Now, there's something wrong with a situation like that. It, it, uh, practically speaking, it will destroy women's sports because physiologically speaking, men, because of testosterone and that they're bigger and heavier, are much more liable to do better in physical sports typically than women will. And to not acknowledge that in the, the setup of the Olympic, uh, less Olympic uh, competitions, I think we're going down a very, very strange road right now. We're going to pay a huge price for this. The notion, for instance, that we're going to wind up with uh, 10 bathrooms. There's going to be a male bathroom, you know, a female bathroom. There's going to be a guy who starts off as a male, his transgender, and the guys don't want him in the bathroom, and the girls don't want him in his bathroom. So there's a third bathroom. There's a girl who started off as a girl. Now she wants to be a male. The guys don't want her in the bathroom, and the girls don't want her in the bathroom. So there's people who discover, decide that they're, they're neither one nor the other, and they were, we're going to wind up with 10 bathrooms in every you know, location. So the practical ramifications of this are huge. 
we need a real rethink about you know where we're going with this exercise now going transgender does not mean in my opinion that we have to go transgender physiologically it means we're going transgender uh, psychologically and spiritually and but i have real issues that we're going to get ourselves in real hot water really really quickly if we continue to indulge a very small percentage of people who are legislating for everybody else it's like uh, if i have a friend who decides one day uh, he's only going to speak french he's no longer going to speak english but he insists that everybody has to speak french to him so we all got we we all got to learn french in order to talk to this guy so we don't have the right to speak english ever because he wants us to speak french so it's like a tiny tiny minority who are now dictating to everybody else this is the oscillation into craziness of a single a single hair on the tail of the dog wagging the entire animal we really need to think about where this is going as i say i have no issues about an adult person making a choice an informed choice i have big problems about teenagers doing it and certainly children of 5 and 6 doing it and parents being punishing being punished for not allowing it to happen it would obviously very much depend on uh, shaquille o'neal i don't know the guy i've only seen him on television yeah. so i would have to say to you what are the reasons why you're deciding today you're a woman and tomorrow you're a man again does it mean that you can you know play a women's basketball on tuesdays and men's basketball on fridays what do you mean by this does this mean that you're moving into an androgynous psychological identification with virtues does it mean that you're moving your spirituality along is there a gimmick that you're doing right now is it a ploy to get in you not be able to kind of play competitions for both i'd have to ask shaquille o'neal or anybody who makes those kinds of assertions what is your reason for doing this there's a very big difference between accepting their path and have them in having them impose their path on us it's very different i have no problem whatsoever with an individual person making a choice for themselves however if they if they start creating legislation that makes it uh, that necessary for us you know to think the same way that they think i have a big issue with that that's a great question i think all of us have had uh, heroes and heroines in our lives who have you know outside of family situations typically and they may be you know uh, famous kind of uh, characters you know television personalities or you know superheroes or whatever but we all look up to some kinds of people so the question then becomes who are the people to whom i look up and what are the qualities you know that i look up to so another exercise that i often give clients of mine is to pick out a uh, three heroes or heroines in your life so and for each of these characters identify the quality that you find most attractive so so for instance i'm going to just make up three characters let's say one of the characters is mother teresa and the second character is um mahatma gandhi and the third character is martin luther king junior and i said okay what is the quality of mother teresa that's most attractive to you and you may say i think it's her compassion and i would say then okay on a scale of 0 to 10 how would you rate mother teresa's compassion and you would say wow well, it's probably a net 9 maybe even a 10 and then i say okay and on the same scale how would you rate your own compassion say, well maybe 5 or 6 and i would say okay your job then is to try to uh, bridge the gap between mother teresa on compassion you know and udval on compassion who was the second character the second character was you know mahatma gandhi what do you appreciate about mahatma gandhi what quality of his you know really inspires you you say would be um um his sense of his sense of peace that he refused ever to get angry you know even to uh, overthrow an occupying colonizing uh, people he refused to get angry so i what i really appreciate about him is his peacefulness and his ability to accomplish without ever getting angry or violent and i'd say okay on a scale of 0 to 10 how would you rate him on that quality and you say maybe 9 or 10 and then i'd say okay and where would you rate yourself on that scale you know where are you when it comes to kind of dealing with difficult situations you know where would you rate yourself and you give yourself a figure and then i say okay great 
Now your job is to try to bridge the gap between your score and Mahatma Gandhi's score on peace. And the third character was you know, Martin Luther King Jr. What do you, what you really admire about him? I admire about him that you know, he stood up for the unrepresented you know, or the disenfranchised and many African-American people, but he, he broadened that out at the end of his life into other communities. So I really appreciate the fact of his um, being a voice for the voiceless. And I would say to you, okay, on a scale of uh, mm -hmm. zero to 10, where would you rate Martin Luther King Jr. on that quality? You say, nine, 10. You say, okay, and where would you rate yourself on that quality? Six, seven? Okay, your job now is to bridge the gap between you and Martin Luther King Jr. You know, on that quality. So it, to answer your question indirectly, it's about picking out your, hero, your heroines and your heroes. Identify the quality that inspires you about them, grading them on that quality, and then grading yourself on the same quality, and then engaging, you know, your job then is to try to bridge the gap between their score and your score. So how best could you do that? It would depend obviously on the quality. Maybe I need to get involved in, in looking after the poor. Maybe I need to understand who's been discriminated against in my community and doing something about that. So it is then finding an outlet uh, to develop that particular quality that you've uh, been inspired by. Great question. Yeah, you could break it any way you want. So Perfect. You know, your score is going to be very individual to you. So right. that, that table on page two is just a very down and dirty way of your categorizing the results. Yeah, but if you find, for instance, that you're uh, 35, 65, you know, that, that's who you are and that's what you've got to work with then. It would be a very interesting exercise for you now that you've mentioned the Dalai Lama to take that list of, of qualities on page one and to go through those qualities and see which of those pertain to the Dalai Lama. And would he be in both columns in some of them? Or would he be exclusively at the left-hand side and the left-hand column? Uh, I, suggest, I would uh, suspect that you would find that, he's, you know, that he has many of the qualities on the left and many of the qualities on the right as well. So um, I wouldn't say that the Dalai Lama you know, is overbalanced in the yin qualities. I would suspect that he's a very balanced character. And I'm, I'm sure that if I took time out to uh, grade him, on the 20 qualities on the left and the 20 qualities on the right, I suspect that I'd find a very balanced situation. Oh. So that would be for the Dalai Lama. Buddhism in general, the first thing you have to realize is that, you know, there are many different uh, schools of Buddhism. You know, there's Mahayana Buddhism, there's Hinayana Buddhism, there's Theravadan Buddhism, many different schools of Buddhism. And so, again, I would suspect that you know, different schools, you know, would uh, represent this a little bit differently. But I would be actually really surprised if um, a spirituality like Buddhism, which I think the Buddha was probably one of the greatest psychologists of all time. Um, I think actually that maybe Jesus Christ, uh, the Buddha, and William Shakespeare were the three greatest psychologists I've ever read for their knowledge of the human psyche. And so for uh, the Buddha and for Buddhism in general, I would really, really imagine that they have enunciated a system which is extremely well balanced, which f factors in all human attributes. And that if we dug in a little bit more deeply, that we would find actually that there's as much yan, uh, yang qualities in Buddhism as there are yin qualities in Buddhism. So there's your task for the next, uh, the next yeah. one. Dig, right. into that and give, dig into that and give us the answer. So what I need to do is I need to go back to page two and formulate it differently so that I'm not confusing people with the instructions. I agree totally with you that that model of the two, the two sided brain, you know, even in earthworms is really, really important that again, it's this uh, movement, this effortless movement, you know, between yin qualities and yang qualities that, that we find in nature. Uh, so thanks a million for just talking about your own situation. Um, my experience as a kind of uh, an expatriate, although I'm here now 33 years and an American citizen, coming from Ireland and then Africa and then to, to the United States, was that the United States was experiencing uh, an extraordinary tumultuous period 
in its uh, self understanding of uh, uh, romantic romantic relationships gender roles femininity masculinity and that there have been two or three generations of american men in my opinion you know who have no idea what side is up at this stage that their old way of being in very very young capacities was no longer being you know rewarded or you know accepted as the norm and that what you wanted was kind of uh, um, a very f uh, kind of feminized version of the male and mm -hmm. in some senses they've stepped out of one role and they haven't found the second role and so mm -hmm. they're afraid to be initiators anymore we're struggling in american society at this stage with the transition that's been occasioned by you know uh, trying to equalize the field between the masculine and the feminine and we haven't found sure ground yet and there are a lot of uh, casualties in the process a lot of marriages uh, casualty in marriages and a lot of casualties in men's self-image and women's need for relationship lots of casualties in those two areas it has been my experience in the 33 years i've lived here that america is going through a transitional period where people are not sure of their sexuality or their gender you know and they're assigned roles if heretofore you know males were assigned there were sociological expectations of a, a, a male you know in his gender and there were sociological expectations of females and it was very very easy to operate everybody knew what their place was and in spite of the fact that there was a dark there was a big shadow side to that in, in, in many ways it worked that system now has been dismantled and it's been dismantled particularly in this country since the 1960s and for good reasons but at the same time, it's led, it's led to a space where people no longer know, know who they are, what's expected of them, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Whether if I make an advance, you know, a romantic kind of gesture to a woman, I'm going to wind up in a kind of a, in a, a me too situation where I'm going to be accused of being inappropriate. So there's a lot of guys in that situation right now who are absolutely scared to be the initiators in a relationship. And it's going to take us time to go through this situation. In the meantime, there's going to be a lot of women you know, reporting what you're reporting, and a lot of guys who are living in fear. The first important distinction is to distinguish between justice and judgment. They're very, very different. And so when Jesus, for instance, do not judge and you will not be judged, judgment is ascribing, you know, ontological value to a person or to an event. Like that's a bad person or this is an unlucky event. So you're literally ascribing ontological value, value in itself, uh, to a, a person or to an event. That's judgment. You know, uh, uh, justice is about evaluation. It is not about judgment. Justice, evaluation is deciding upon the appropriate response to a person or to an event. There's no need for judgment. You don't have to categorize somebody as being good or bad or ugly or whatever uh, in order to uh, decide on the appropriate response to the person or to the situation. So justice then is about determining what is the right thing to do, the right response to make in this situation or to this, this person. But it has zero to do with the, uh, making a judgment about them. And that incident that you mentioned, for instance, of Jesus overturning the tables in the temple, it always strikes me that this was a symbolic gesture. I don't think that Jesus was get in there and he was really, really mad with everybody else and he was throwing tables over and whipping people. I think that was, uh, that was a symbolic representation of Jesus' you know, concern that the church itself or the temple itself was being turned into a marketplace and a trading. Uh, so Jesus was a, was a master of the symbol. There was no way that Jesus violently you know, lashed out and hit somebody with a whip or upscuttled tables. This was you know, a symbolic you know, rendition of his you know, uh, uh, evaluation of the appropriate response to make to what was been happening in the temple. So for yourself, when you look at the mercy focus versus justice focus and the transition in your own lifetime, it's uh, an, an invitation to you to realize that mercy is very, very important. It's also important you know, to uh, be able to evaluate the appropriateness of the response in a situation, and that calls for justice, but not necessarily for judgment. Yeah, it is a dance, obviously it is a dance. And uh, the importance of the dance is so in the Celtic dispensation, for instance, you know, the day begins at dusk. You know, we think that day begins when the sun comes up. 
for the Celts, the day began when the sun went down. That was the beginning of the day because you were entering into the womb of the mystery of the night, which gave birth to the light subsequently. So it wasn't the battle between light and dark. It wasn't that night gobbled up the light. It was that uh, dark was the fertile womb in which life was conceived and given back to the world. In the same way for the Celts, the year began with Samhain, which is the 1st of November. And so it's, the winter is the beginning of the year for the Celts. So it's the mysterious fallow time when the earth is uh, pregnant, but not, just, not yet sending up roots. That's going to come around Bialtana, the next big fe feast, 1st of May. And so this realization that this is a dance that keeps recycling light and dark are not enemies, one gobbling up the other and the other outshining the first. It is the natural cycle of birth, rebirth, death and resurrection. And so whether that happens on a daily basis beginning at dusk or on a yearly basis beginning in Samhain or on a personal basis beginning with difficulties, you know, that birth, you know, new uh, transcendent possibilities, it's a game that continues to flow constantly. And so you know that in the yin-yang symbol, they're actually like two teardrops folded into each other. And I can't imagine that if you had two teardrops of different color and you folded them in like that, that they would remain separated. They'd actually begin to emerge with each other. And so uh, in some sense, yin-yang is a prelude to the, the totality of union with source when there isn't a differentiation necessary anymore. And so I say then that yin and yang is the penultimate stage of the spiritual journey. It's not the ultimate stage, it's the penultimate stage. So eventually they flow into each other, you know, and they create a single droplet, which is neither white nor black, but in fact is, uh, it, it is the, the blood that courses through our veins and enlivens us for incarnation. So thank you guys for listening and we'll see you tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock with God's help. <laughs>